situation deteriorates, rumors suggest she to make major move in June. A new round of Sinoas trade war, what's different this time? A comprehensive analysis. 2024, intensifying storm of middle-class impoverishment in mainland China. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Situation deteriorates, rumors suggest she to make big move in June. On a riveting episode of NTD TV's Elite Forum, experts dissected what could be a game-changing strategy from CCP leader Xi Jinping this June, amidst China's economic downturn. Inside sources reveal that in a recent meetup with top American business figures, she hinted at brewing a major initiative. There's also buzz that the postponed 20th third plenary session of the CCP, originally set for last October, might finally convene this June. These crucial sessions are typically pivotal for shaping economic policy, sparking intense speculation, will Xi's upcoming move be an economic lifeline, or does he have a different ace up his sleeve? Situation deteriorates, she poised to launch big move. Experts in the elite forum suggest that Xi's plan might involve masking economic failures and mimicking Mao Zedong's political maneuvers, leveraging new productive forces to sow global chaos, and reshaping the state council to consolidate his autocratic power. Internet pundit Lao Deng suggested that Xi's much-discussed big move could merely be a massive monetary easing, an influx of capital into the markets, or superficial economic tweaks, effectively just band-aid solutions. He expressed skepticism about any revival of dated reforms from the CCP's 18th third plenary session. Meanwhile, Guijun, editor-in-chief of Epic Times, highlighted that the CCP's likely financial strategy might involve ramping up the already voluminous money-printing efforts. Despite this, the staggering $42 trillion US dollars in M2 money supply has only generated a $17 trillion US dollars GDP. This excess liquidity largely stagnates in banks or state-owned firms, earmarked more for debt servicing than productive investment, failing to stimulate true economic growth and leading to rampant, controlled inflation that disrupts various sectors. Ms. Gua further notes that she now sees new quality productivity as a vital fix for China's economic woes. The CCP believes its decade-long heavy investment in high-tech sectors like electric vehicles and semiconductors has paid off. However, the success of these ventures depends on various factors, particularly as the U.S. tightens restrictions on Chinese high-tech exports amid changing global market conditions. China also grapples with a severe internal and external trust crisis. This has led foreign and private domestic investors to ignore China's plight. Despite numerous economic stimulus efforts over the past year, the economy remains sluggish. To divert attention from these economic troubles, experts believe the CCP plans to disrupt global affairs to compel international cooperation, while domestically intensifying authoritarianism and mimicking Mao's historical tactics, all part of Xi's broader strategy. She posits that the CCP needs to engineer a global crisis to compel the U.S. to engage diplomatically, given suspicions that the CCP is behind the recent sharp escalations in global tensions. Since it's no longer feasible to actively improve relations, the CCP resorts to various means to disrupt the world, forcing others to cooperate with it. Therefore, with the sudden changes in the world, there's a sense of an invisible evil force manipulating things from behind. Lao Deng also speculates that she might secure his regime through unexpectedly radical measures, such as elevating his wife, Peng Liuan, to the Politburo, or further centralizing power, a move that seems to follow Mao's legacy of using political upheaval to address economic failures, such as during the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution. Ms. Guo highlights a stark pivot in Beijing's strategy as it clings to authoritarian tactics to address emerging challenges, thereby solidifying the Communist Party's hold over China's economic and societal structures. With no intention of easing its iron grip, the prospect of political reforms is vanishing. Xi Jinping has overtly ruled out any structural changes in governance during discussions with American executives, instead charting a course for personalized political changes. 
This shift could radically alter the state council's operations, moving from a collaborative cabinet framework to a centralized presidential model, or even towards a monolithic autocracy mirroring the absolute rule seen in the Qing dynasty, where one emperor's word was law. Xi Jinping personally manages economy, stock market, outlook not favorable. Under Xi Jinping's direct control and his anti-pandemic policy, after three years aiming for a complete eradication of COVID-19, China's economy is now grappling with a series of crises including the collapse of the real estate sector, a significant exodus of foreign capital, shrinking foreign trade, persistently high youth unemployment, sluggish economic growth, factory shutdowns, escalating government debt at all levels, and a continuously plummeting stock market. The internet, educational training sectors, platform economies, and the digital economy have all suffered under Xi Jinping's heavy crackdowns. Over the past year, neither the Chinese economy's expected vengeful rebound nor the public's similar rebound materialized, and the demographic advantage has also disappeared. Despite various efforts, the CCP has been unable to revive the faltering Chinese economy. Voice of America published an article indicating that in today's China, where there is a call to follow Xi Jinping's directives unequivocally, Xi's direct management of the economy and stock market is generally viewed unfavorably. Some international media believe his economic policies might even trigger a trade war, with more harm than good likely to result. On January 23, an article in the CCP's official media, People's Daily, reported on Xi's directives for financial work, which frightened investors. Xi stated, We must adhere to serving the real economy as the primary purpose of our financial sector. Marx poignantly critiqued a delusion in capitalist societies of making money without the mediation of production processes. This is a profound warning against detaching from reality. For China, a large country with over 1.4 billion people, only by securing our food supply and strengthening our manufacturing base can we provide a solid material foundation for achieving socialist modernization. Many observers note that Xi's disdain for making money without production processes clearly includes making profits through stock market investments. Xi expressed a preference for agriculture and manufacturing sectors. On January 9, The Economist published an article titled Xi Jinping Risks Setting Off Another Trade War. The piece noted that Chinese leaders are obsessed with lithium-ion batteries, electric cars, and solar panels. These sorts of technologies will, Xi Jinping has proclaimed, become pillars of the economy. He is spending big to ensure this happens, meaning, in the years to come, that his ambitions will be felt across the world. A manufacturing export boom could very well lead to a trade war. Other commentators have suggested that Chinese rulers have long relied on economic achievements to legitimize their rule. Now, she faces an economic crisis both domestically and internationally, brought on by his own misguided policies that have devastated China's economy. Amid public skepticism about the optimistic economic reports continuously released by official media, Chinese authorities have also claimed through the Ministry of State Security that spreading bad economic news constitutes a national security threat, with security agencies ready to crack down according to law. Meanwhile, Xi Jinping and the CCP remain living in their fabricated Chinese dream. A new round of sino us trade war, what's different this time? A comprehensive analysis. Electric vehicles and other green technologies from China have become the new flashpoint in the ongoing trade war between the United States and China. The Chinese government's significant increase in the production of inexpensive electric vehicles, solar panels, and batteries has raised growing concerns in the United States, Europe, Mexico, and other countries. Western nations are worried that China is attempting to boost its struggling economy through a surge in exports, which could potentially harm the interests of foreign companies. According to the International Energy Agency in Paris, after over a decade of subsidies for automakers, China now has a vast automotive industry that dominates 60% of the global electric vehicle market. However, the Alliance for American Manufacturing, AAM, has found that Chinese companies produce 10 million more electric vehicles annually than they can sell domestically. 
This surplus has prompted them to expand sales internationally. This pattern is also seen in other sectors such as solar panels, batteries, and traditional industries like steel. In a February report, the AAM pointed out that the Chinese car manufacturer BYD has launched an electric SUV priced incredibly low at just $14,000, labeling the Chinese auto industry as a significant threat to U.S. car makers. The U.S. currently enforces a 25% tariff on imported Chinese cars, while Mexico, under a free trade agreement with the U.S., provides a tariff-free channel for these cars into the American market. This loophole allows automakers to bypass the steep U.S. tariffs by manufacturing in Mexico. At an Ohio rally in mid-March, former President Donald Trump criticized China's strategy of exporting cars to the U.S. via Mexico. He proposed implementing a 100% tariff on these vehicles if re-elected, declaring, we will impose a 100% tariff on every car in the parking lot of Chinese auto manufacturing plants in Mexico. Speaking in Guangzhou on April 6, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen reflected on her visit to Suniva, a solar cell manufacturer in Norcross, Georgia. She highlighted the Biden administration's concerns over China's practice of dumping low-cost products on foreign markets. Yellen mentioned that Suniva, like many others, had to close due to the competition with underpriced Chinese imports. She emphasized the ongoing issues with China's production overcapacity, stating, it's crucial we prevent this from happening again. Our allies share our concerns about the risks to their own markets. I believe that addressing these policies will benefit the U.S., China, and the global economy. China remains the leading producer of solar cells worldwide. Suniva, which shut down in 2017 due to competitive pressures, is resuming operations with support from subsidies provided by the Biden administration's Inflation Reduction Act. How this trade war could be different the Associated Press strikingly describes the current economic tensions as a rerun of a familiar movie, according to U.S. officials, echoing the disruptive impact of the original China shock that jolted the U.S. and global markets at the turn of the century. This latest wave of cheap Chinese exports is being branded as China Shock 2.0, a sequel to the economic upheaval that cost the U.S. over 2 million jobs from 1999 to 2011, as noted by economists like Otter. However, unlike the first shockwave which caught many by surprise, the world is now proactively countering the effects of this renewed surge. The onset of China Shock 2.0 has met with a robust response, including continued tariffs on Chinese goods initiated by Trump and upheld by the Biden administration. Brad Setzer, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, highlights a key shift, What's new this time around is the intense focus on overcapacity in critical advanced industries, signaling a strategic response to China's economic maneuvers. The Chinese government only subsidizes production, not consumption. The United States provides subsidies to specific sectors, with the Biden administration enacting legislation to support clean energy and semiconductor industries. In contrast, the CCP subsidies have drawn criticism, including a formal complaint to the World Trade Organization, alleging that U.S. subsidies on electric vehicle purchases violate trade rules. A 2022 report by the Center for Strategic and International Studies revealed that China's industrial subsidies in 2019 were double those of the U.S. in dollar terms. Economists like Ishwar Prasad from Cornell University and former Treasury official Saiz highlight a key difference in subsidy strategy, the CCP heavily subsidizes production but neglects to stimulate consumer spending, unlike the U.S., which has launched multiple stimulus packages to boost consumer spending during the COVID-19 pandemic. Analysts caution that focusing solely on production subsidies without enhancing domestic consumption can lead to severe overcapacity issues. Despite this, CCP subsidies enable Chinese companies to sell their products internationally at much lower prices than their competitors, attracting significant criticism from Western countries. The trade war is poised to escalate globally. Currently, both China and the U.S. have agreed in principle to discuss China's overcapacity issues, although the CCP has yet to commit to any actions to alleviate U.S. concerns. 
Nevertheless, the CCP recognizes that manufacturing overcapacity and sluggish consumer spending are significant obstacles to its goal of sustainable economic growth. The swift increase in electric vehicle production has led to intense price competition, likely driving some manufacturers to bankruptcy. According to the Associated Press, industrial policy expert Huang Hanquan stated that China needs improved policy coordination to support new technology development rather than encouraging every province to overinvest in the same industries. In light of these issues, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned that such overcapacity poses a risk to global economic stability and plans to address this with international partners at the upcoming IMF and World Bank Spring meetings in Washington, D.C. This event will gather financial leaders from the G7, G20, and significant economies from the global south. The U.S. intends to use its prominent role in these forums to unite with countries from Europe, Asia, and Latin America to confront concerns about China's aggressive production and export strategies. This consensus on overcapacity being a global concern will be a central topic of discussion, as noted by U.S. officials and Josh Lipsky from the Atlantic Council. Alarm over Chinese exports has also been raised by G7 nations like Canada, France, and Germany, with Brazilian President Lula initiating probes into suspected dumping of industrial goods like steel. Meanwhile, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva is engaging with Chinese leaders to encourage a shift towards boosting domestic demand and transitioning more of China's economy to service-oriented sectors to address these overcapacity challenges. In response to these concerns, the U.S. and the European Commission are considering imposing new tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles to mitigate the effects of this overproduction on their markets. 2024, Intensifying Storm of Middle-Class Impoverishment in Mainland China China's middle class, once a beacon of the country's economic strength, is now facing a pronounced poverty crisis, signaling a downturn in China's economic fortunes as a result of shifting CCP macroeconomic policies. The situation has grown increasingly dire in 2024, with the middle class feeling the brunt of broader economic difficulties. A stark manifestation of these challenges is the significant drop in personal income tax revenue, which fell by 15.9% year-on-year in the first two months of the year, totaling a loss of 326.2 billion yuan, about 45.08 billion US dollars. This decline predominantly affects those with annual incomes over 100,000 yuan, about 13,819 US dollars, a demographic largely composed of middle-class professionals. The financial difficulties are further compounded by falling house prices, stock market instability, diminishing incomes, lower bonuses, and devaluation in financial products and collectibles, painting a picture of a multi-pronged financial assault on the middle class. The vulnerabilities of this demographic have expanded from the initial financial peril trio of high mortgages, unemployed spouses, and expensive education for children, to what is now described as the five traps of middle-class impoverishment. These traps include unwise business investments, excessive spending on real estate, luxury education expenditures, financial guarantees for others, and risky financial schemes. The expanded list of economic pitfalls points to a deepening crisis within the middle class. Reports indicate a troubling trend. In 2023, 43% of middle class families saw their assets diminish, a sharp increase from 31% in 2022 and only 8% in 2021. Individual stories reflect this data, such as that of a Shanghai white collar worker who struggled significantly with job searches in early 2022. Despite sending thousands of resumes, he received few interview invitations, eventually settling for a job with a reduced salary and no social security benefits. This situation was compounded when his state-owned employer implemented a 10% salary cut across the board. Consumer behavior is shifting dramatically as middle-class individuals cut back on all forms of expenditure. Notable declines include luxury purchases with Gucci seeing a nearly 20% drop in sales, resulting in a $9 billion loss for its parent company. Additionally, Swiss watch exports to China and Hong Kong have plummeted. 
Lifestyle changes are evident too, with fewer middle-class Chinese traveling abroad and a significant downturn in the piano industry, once a symbol of middle-class aspiration, now facing collapsing sales and shop closures. In January, Bloomberg reported unprecedented salary cuts across 38 major Chinese cities, highlighting the wide-reaching impact of these economic pressures across sectors typically dominated by middle-class employment such as real estate, finance, public services, education, healthcare, and new technology industries. The financial pinch is felt acutely in year-end bonuses as well, a February survey indicated a 17.5% drop in average bonuses for white-collar workers in 2023, with the steepest cuts seen in the financial sector. The reduction in income and the consequent erosion of consumer confidence is creating a negative cycle that threatens economic stability and recovery. These developments underscore the significant role the middle class plays in societal stability, its potential erosion indicates transformative and possibly turbulent times ahead for China's socioeconomic landscape. Let us know your thoughts on today's topic by leaving a comment below. If you found this video helpful, please share it with a friend, it inspires us to continue creating more quality and reliable content. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more interesting insights from China Truths. Thanks for tuning in.